Psalm 116, I'll read the first few verses. And then another, another introduction towards the end there. And Psalm 116 says this, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Sorrows of death and the pain of hell got hold upon me. I'm troubled and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord. And righteous, yea, our God is merciful. And if you'll read verse 15, cast your eye upon that verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the Savior. With great solemnity, I share with our church family that our beloved Barry Sink has passed away. Yesterday, he stepped into eternity, met his and our beloved Savior to face to face. And indeed, hearts are shattered in our church. Is missing a beloved, welcoming, and inviting reader. It's cold outside. It's a little colder about seeing my friend, Brother Barry, there in the footsteps. And I must admit that one day, perhaps when I get to heaven, if St. Peter is there at the pearly gates, I'll be a little disappointed. As I expect Brother Barry to continue to man his post at the front gate, the front door. To welcome the rest of the sin. <laughs> Try to find comfort and encouragement. This last day, my mind immediately raised. Psalm 116, as we've read here. And that key word. To know that while we grieve, yes, indeed, with a hope that no other may know, except they be a Christian as well, but we do indeed grieve. Our love feels as though it has nowhere to go. Thank God that in His mercy, He sees from this world into the next. As I cast my eyes across, sacred text of scripture, I find that it's not just death, the death of his saints that he finds precious, but he also has precious thoughts toward us, as David explained in Psalm 139. In fact, they're not just precious and few in number, they are indeed great in some. David recalled the, that those great and precious thoughts were many in number towards. And as Peter himself reflected on the truth that is in Jesus Christ, he could not escape that word, precious. And he explained that Jesus Christ and his blood indeed was precious. And we were not redeemed with such crude things as silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And with such precious blood of Christ, we are left great. And in fact, Peter uses the word exceedingly great and precious promises. These promises are realized in Jesus Christ. And I think that because of all the precious things that God has, I cherish the precious thing that we have with Brother Barry, whether regardless of what our relationship with him may have been. And that's his precious love, friendship, his enduring compassion, his legacy of love, his authentic warmth and care. We know Brother Barry was a friar, and it didn't take much because he loved. He loved so much. And his love to me and to many others, certainly if to me, then multiplied and magnified to the others here today, was precious as well. He indeed was a fighter, and he fought. To fight until the very end. 
and he indeed kept the faith. And he finished his course. And he stands upon something else that's precious, not just a promise, a thought, but he stands upon what Revelation chapter 21 calls precious things. He right now is standing upon not just the precious promises. We thank God for what he left for us and what Brother Barry is presently experiencing in this precious way. I'm thankful for his legacy, everything from sausage biscuits for every fishing trip to yard work. Never had yard work until I met Brother Barry, amen. <laughs> but it's his lack, it's his love. Um, so as we think about him, we think about our own lives, the very legacy that we are presently making. Let us remember life that Jesus Christ has given to us through his life that one day as we look forward to those precious stones upon which we shall stand as we stand presently on his precious promises and thank God for it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your everlasting mercy, your enduring strength, and the grace that we have. Truly gracious is the Lord and righteous. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, help us to find rest in you. We thank you for the great bounty wherewith you dealt with us. We thank you for the deliverance of our soul from death. And we thank you for these precious promises. And as we draw close to you, we come to you with thanksgiving. Thanking you for your servant, Brother Barry, and thanking you how you've given us the assurance of hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. God be praised for this precious gift. And we come to you praising you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He's real. Page number 31. He lives. He's real and he's alive. You know what I'm doing today. Page 31. Let's stand as we sing. I serve a reason. <laughs>
Series through the gospel of Matthew, which I have terms focused to follow, following the Lord Jesus Christ as a disciple according to Matthew's gospel. And today we examine some interesting, interesting, seemingly backwards perspectives. That'll make more sense, or it'll just remain backwards. We'll see. But Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 21, and we'll read down through verse number 28. For the Bible tells us here, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou favorest not the things that be of God, but things that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, and whosoever will lose his life, for my sake, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This morning's message is entitled, No Cross, No Crown. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word that you have given to us. Lord, we offer this as, a, as an act of worship to you. And I pray, Father, that it would be receptive, not just to this audience, but to you, Lord. And I pray you'll give us wisdom as we seek to glorify you in our lives, and as we follow you, we deny ourselves in doing so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mandy Seal. I was on vacation recently with uh, my family, and we were exploring some of the nearby sites, especially in the, the touristy part of town uh, around our hotel. And the girls spotted something. They spotted a house of mirrors. And they wanted to go, they wanted to go, and I've been in one of these things. So it was a hard pass for me. I was not interested. Because, you know, it's super easy to get lost in there. Left is right, right is left. You need to get closer to things, you move further away. It's backwards. It's just a really strange way of thinking, and it was very confusing. I had no desire to go back into a house of mirrors despite my children's plea. Now, something similar happens in Matthew's Gospel. Our Lord Jesus Christ has given us some backwards-looking things. Now, in reality... They are encapsulating what the real life really is. But to everyone else around him, they were kind of backwards from time to time. It was like looking in a mirror for them. Let me give you some examples. There are some strange paradoxes that will pop up all throughout Matthew's God. For example, you have to save your life. In order to save your life, you have to lose it. If you thirst, mourn, and are persecuted, you're not miserable. The first shall be last, and don't forget the last shall be first. And the greatest in the kingdom of God is actually the least, that is, the most humble. How, how is all this possible? I mean, to save your life, you've got to lose it. Well, he's teaching in his own way that the Son of Man is going to come in glory when he talks about the But first he has to suffer and die. The king, 
Christ the King has to be crucified, not go for comfort. See, that's a very backwards way of looking at things, or so it seems, right? Because here in our passage, now that we have this mirror mentality in mind, I want to show you a few concepts that will seem backwards. Ideas that we would have never come to see unless God showed them to us in his way of doing so. And he's going to show us the way real life really works. Now, here's my sermon in a sentence. Not giving me permission to check out. Just the bottom line of the front. We want to receive a crown of glory upon our own heads. Then we must first robe ourselves in self-denial and suffering. No cross, no crown. Now, the first backwards concept is easy to spot. Is Jesus Christ will be crucified. Christ will suffer and die. And we know that Jesus is the Christ in verse 16 of this very chapter. We see that Paul, or excuse me, Peter makes this incredible profession that he recognizes that Jesus is the Christ. But in verse number 21, we see Christ, the king, doesn't come to conquer, he comes to be crushed. Let's read that text again, verse 21. From that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and be free from the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now here the context is king and the context, verses 13 through 20, tell us that Jesus is the king. You are the Christ, Peter says. That is great confession. And Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He's the king, right? So, that's it. Where is he? What's really next? Here's what's next. Christ is crucified. Wait. Crucified. Crucified. No, no. You mean Christ is conquering. I mean, he's the king. How do we get the kingdom? He goes forth and conquers. He's going to take it over. Let's sit down and figure out our strategy. Let's find out how this is going to work. Let's Let's get rid of that nasty political power and overthrow these religious hypocrites. I mean, let's just get them out of the way. They have really have authority. Let's just proceed against the infidels. I know. When we take the whole city back, we get it all work out. It'll all work out. I mean, just imagine Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a huge white horse, and he had a pilot and Herod riding next to him. Well, well not, not right next to him, you know, just, just a little way back. And their horses are. A little bit smaller, a little bit darker, you know, just a little, a little bit more menacing, so we can kind of spot them. And then here you have Caiaphas, the high priest, and he's going to lead Jesus and his horse all the way through Jerusalem and start chanting and get the crowd into it. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the Son of David! And people are just going to be thrilled, right? Right? Hello? Is this, is this Peter, Peter, that's what we're going to do. That's what, that's what Peter's great idea is. And that all of this is somehow going to work out. So when Jesus expressed that, we read in verse number 21 that, no, no, it's not Christ conquering, it's Christ crucified. Now you have the part about the king, but crucified? No, that, there, there's no way. There's no way that that can be. But Jesus says, Christ, yes. Crucified also is. That's the plan of God. It's not a mere prediction like what we see in weather forecasts. No, this is a definite, authoritative, divine plan of God. In fact, Acts chapter 2 would we'll call it a predetermined counsel according to the foreknowledge of God. This is God's plan. And if we not even just look at the book of Acts, we see that even Isaiah spoke about this, that it will please the Lord to bruise him to crush him. The Lord laid on him, that's Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. That's how I did this. This is how Jesus himself would put it. He says, I must go. Not I will go. This is the Son of Man, according to Luke chapter 24, verse 7. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. I must go to Jerusalem. You know, that city where millions of atoning sacrifices have been offered, but I'm going there. 
not, not to just be a mere, uh, to sacrifice a mere lamb. No, behold, the lamb of God. I will sacrifice myself once and for all, for millions, for the sins of the whole world. That's what I must go to do. I must go to Jerusalem. Not, not to gather its leaders to my side, to, to watch them instead pierce myself. Not to crown me as a king, but to crown me with thorns. To mock me, spit at me. Christ crucified? Huh. Human wisdom? That's nonsense. Christ crucified? No, no. Jerusalem wouldn't understand. Christ crucified? No. The first disciples wouldn't get it either. They're, they're missing what's right there in the mirror because. The idea of the Messiah being put to death as a, as a public nuisance, as a religious and political traitor, well, that's all too shocking. It's too backwards for them to comprehend. Now, we'll get to what Peter thinks about this in a minute, but for right now, just let's, let's try to get our heads around this. Because really, foundationally, nothing has really changed in people's way of thinking from then till now. That Paul will come along and make the same observation in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Why? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's just plain simple. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet, Christ crucified is the crux of Christianity. A summary symbol of our faith is not a book or a dove or a shamrock. It's a cross. The old rugged cross. So despised by the world. The old rugged cross. A symbol of suffering and shame. The old rugged cross stained with blood so that Maybe foolishness to the world, but we cannot be Christ centered without being cross centered. The first surprise, first backwards idea is that Christ, the King, would be crucified, that he would come and suffer and die, that Jesus' passion and death must precede his resurrection, return, and glorification, that the cross had to come before the crown. But it goes even further, because there are stumbling stones laid out. In fact, this is where it will become more personal. We must see ourselves as self-centered as well. See, the second surprise is found right there in Peter himself. See, Peter himself is going to be the stumbling stone, and we'll work our way through the text here. Peter goes from the most important confession in the history of the world. You, Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's right. Peter opens his mouth and declares from on high that Jesus is the King. He's the Messiah, the Anointed One. He's the One. And then 20 seconds later, he opens his mouth, sticks in his foot, and then the other, there's room for the other foot, both hands and both elbows. He gets it all in there. And in the span of just a few seconds, he goes from really to back. On one hand, Peter got an eight points, moves to the front of the class. And then, that's Peter, in verse number 21, you can see that he balked at this idea that Jesus must suffer and be killed, as the text tells us. And Peter, now thinking that he's gone from, you know, star student just to uh, now becoming the head of the Bible department, he takes Jesus aside, takes Jesus aside. He's to rebuke him. To rebuke him, saying, Far be it from thee, Lord, far be it from you. In, in essence, he's saying, You know what? God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for you, and uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Time, over. Nothing. This shall never happen to you. And then, verse 23, Jesus, oh, the sea will look on his face. Don't you just wish he could be a fly on the wall? He comes along and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan, you're an offense to me. You, you're causing people to suffer. Why? Because you don't say the things of God. Say it's not the things of God. 
Your mind isn't set on the things of God. It's set on the things of man. Now, this is Peter, the very bag of glass. Jesus handed him his hat with a little D on it. But the D doesn't stand for dunce. It stands for devil. And what's surprising is that Peter has gone from someone that professes that Jesus Christ is the king to someone, surprisingly, that doesn't get, that doesn't see Christ as the crucified. Now, it should be puzzling for us. We have an advantage, don't we? We can read this whole story in just a matter of minutes. We see how all the finished pieces fit so nicely into the puzzle and it fits perfectly and it makes sense to us, but we're not sitting around the table with Jesus. See, Peter, he'll eventually get it. So let's not be Peter up to it. He goes on in his own first epistle to say, He himself, that Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his own wounds, yes. But here, they're looking at it all backwards. The garment Jesus is wearing reads, conquering Christ in the mirror. But in reality, it says Christ crucified. See, Peter had to die to sin. He had to die to what he held. What did he hold dear? The belief in an earthly kingdom of Christ that provides the Roman Empire. He thought it could all be taken care of because Christ the King was finally here. See, like Peter, we stumble over ourselves. We stumble over our desires, our ambition. We have an idea in mind of what we think God should do for us. We feel like God owes us owes us some answers, and owes us the fulfillment of our own agenda. But interestingly, this type of thinking is satanic. No Ouija boards out in that. No terror cards, no occult business, just thinking like the devil. We are not God's counselor. Peter went on to be a great pastor, but he thought he could pastor Jesus. Jesus, let me just, let me just lie. Let me just, come on over here. Let's talk. The moment we get to the place where we think we can Jesus and become God, we're in very dangerous ground. God is powerful. He needs not to be informed. Even if he had a need, which he does not, we would be the last people he would tell about how to satisfy. But just like we too have to die to our substance. What we hold dear, what we feel like we are owed, we have to live instead of God's will and God's grace. See, this is no longer merely about us. Now, Jesus sees and will expose the beauty issue living. And this is where what I call the passion pattern comes into effect because we must follow the pattern of Jesus Christ. And we must follow that pattern to the cross. And then, and only then, does the crown come. With this text, we're looking into the mirror where everything is backwards. And finally, we come to this last shocker, this last bit of surprise that as I turn the passion pattern, we'll see in verses 24 to 28. It's undeniable and unmistakable. Cross, then crown. Let's read that text once again together. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, whosoever will lose his life for my sake, shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man. Verily I say unto you, there, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. See, the pattern that is surprising to us 
is that Jesus has something for us in mind. He speaks not just of his work, but of our work. Astonishing. He says, in essence, listen, here's the work that I will do for you to save your souls. But he doesn't say, now sit back and just go enjoy my finished work. Instead, he says, get to work. Not as the basis of your salvation, these gentlemen are already saved. And so what's shocking to them is that they don't get to sit and rest on the laurels of Jesus. But it's that to go do something in order to be Christ's life. It's surprising that this work is also cross work. Jesus says, I have my cross, and you have yours. You say, why? Why, Lord? I mean, after all that you've done, why our cross is also? Why not? Your cross and our cross. What why not reward us now? What why do we have to deal with suffering? Reward now, suffer now. You see, the Lord uh, uh, doesn't expect us. Let me back. Up. We cannot avoid as much as we would say avoiding suffering is our highest priority. And as much as we grapple on to our Americanism that pursuit of happiness is indeed a constitutional right, it is not necessarily a comfortable lifestyle may be expected in suburbia. But no cross, no crime. That's not a bumper sticker you're going to see on the newest Porsche SUV or even on that old car. It just doesn't. It's surprising, shocking, backwards that we, we have cross work to do as well. And there's his cross and our cross. If anyone, if anyone, anyone, anyone come after me, he said, let me deny myself. Take up his cross and follow me. Write that verse on your doorpost, bind it to your forehead, tuck it deep within the recesses of your heart because this is the central element of everyone's Christian life. It's in the center of the gospel. It's in the center of our lives. Right. Now let me ask you, what makes a Christian a Christian? What makes a church a church? What are really the marks of a church? What are the characteristics of a Christian? There's two. Based on Matthew chapter 16, we can see that number one, we must confess Jesus is Christ. And number two, follow Jesus Suffering. Right. That's it. What I call and what the text calls the crucified life. And the Apostle Paul would pick up on this, no doubt. And he summarized it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. But he understood that that doesn't stop with death. He understood that the crucified life is not uh, uh, under the curse of death. Rather, it's one that experiences the glorification of Jesus Christ in an ongoing and abiding experience. The presence of Christ is within us by the Holy Spirit. And because Christ has lifted the curse of death, we don't live under that apprehension. The crucified life always leads to the glorious dawn of the resurrection from the dead. There is always hope in Jesus Christ. When Paul speaks about the resurrection, it doesn't just apply to a, a future hope. It applies to a lively hope, a living hope that abides with us right now. He goes on to say, it's not I who lives. I'm not the one that lives. But Christ lives in me. If he lives in us, then we will live eternally. We will experience this awesome that Paul left for us of Jesus' words. We indeed must confess and do confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is our King. He is our Christ. We also, with that confession, follow him. Die of self. 
and with the price. That's exactly what Jesus is teaching. Yeah, he, he teaches that we must carry a cross. He teaches us that that cross looks a certain way, but thankfully, he gives us good reasons why carrying the cross is actually worth it. Now, first, why must we carry the cross? And what is this cross? Some may say that it's enduring suffering. There's trials and tribulations of life, the death of a loved one, economic hardship, poor health, financial loss, a bad boss, a nagging wife, a lazy husband. I got those ones. Okay. <laughs> a rebellious child. You can't forget those things. And so on and so on. Or is it persecution? You know, suffering for believing, preaching, living out the gospel. It's not either or. It's both. It's both. Whether it's enduring suffering and struggles through trials and temptations or persecutions for what you believe. It's both. But they all center on this one thing. Self-denial. I say that because of how Jesus said. If any man come after me, let him deny. Cross and follow for the worship. What does it mean to come after or follow Jesus? Well, metaphorically, it means take the cross literally. It means to deny yourself. Deny yourself. To follow Jesus means to deny yourself. The sum of the Christian life is self denial. Is that how you would summarize your Christian life? As one of self denial. See, to come. To Jesus Christ is to deny yourself, to admit that we're sinful and that we need a Savior, to live for Christ is to deny yourself, to abide in Him, to pray to Him, to walk with Him, to know His power. God's plan of salvation, as well as His plan of sanctification, have one summary coming Deny yourself. So, Christ followers, how's that going? How's your self denial taking place? Are you saying no? To those sins that so easily entangle you? Are you saying yes to Christ, doing some difficult things for his sake? Do you sacrifice your time, your money, your convenience, your comfort, your safety to those to do those things that Jesus commands? Those things that even if we just took this list recited at the day of judgment, that we would feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty and receive the stranger and clothe the naked and care for the sick and, and visit the imprisoned. Yes, self-denial is the sum of the Christian life. Or to put it positively, following Jesus as Lord, that's the sum of the Christian life. Not the self-love and the self-rule, but Jesus as first love and best rule. He is king. Now, Jesus knows the way to glory. Because he passes through the city of suffering and down the road of rejection and through the valley of the shadow of death. He knows what self-denial is, and he knows the glory of his resurrection. Self-denial is saying Jesus is Lord and living like you mean it. Now, how do you know you mean it? Well, what's the motivation? It's a morbid mission. You see in verses 25 and 28 that Jesus provides this very motive. He says, and I'll paraphrase here, for whosoever, in verse 25, for what will it profit? He begs the question in verse 26. For the Son of Man is going to come. He's going to return. The all-encompassing reason is that Jesus wins, and those with him win. And those not with him. If you choose the cross now, you get the crown. But if you choose the crown now, you get the cross now. Now, verse 28, admittedly, is very difficult. We'll read here, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, this verse could refer to several things. It could be the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. It could be the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It could be about the resurrection and the return of Jesus Christ. Or it could just refer, uh, refer to a general predict prediction about Christ's future. Encompassing it, the resurrection, the ascension, the Pentecost, and his heavenly, uh, his heavenly intercession. Now, I think, and if you don't agree with this, that's fine. My opinion, you throw it away the basket. I think this is about the transfiguration. Transfiguration. Can't even say it, bro. 
For some, that would be the case, Peter, James, and John, but I can see the Son of Man, that's Jesus, in his kingdom glory. And verse 28 is difficult, but verse 27 is the key verse. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man for you in his works. Then the righteous are rewarded, and the unrighteous are undone. Frosting crown. Cross. It's unmistakable that in our text, Jesus is talking about his own passion, death, and resurrection, and now his return to judge. That's absolutely clear. But when Jesus comes to judge, those that did not deny themselves to follow him, those that try to hold on to life as, as though it's the most precious entity, the most precious experience that they'll have, those that try to live for the gain of this world and, and to touch and taste all the pleasures that are in this life. They forfeit the game of life. Only doing for Jesus, only doing for others in the name of Jesus is what ultimately matters. He who dies with the most poise certainly is not me. Let me be absolutely clear. Jesus isn't saying like uh, the weightlifters do to try to coax each other. No pay, no care. And that may be true. Jim. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's, he's not saying it's not no pain, no gain. It's no pain, much more pain. This, this carries the seriousness of heaven and hell. Discipleship is, is not tea time. It's not a casual conversation over coffee. It, it's life or death. In fact, it's eternal life and eternal, and eternal death. Because at the last judgment, Jesus will not slap the wrist of those professing Christians who toyed with his teachings or who tinkered with power and possession but, or chose self-indulgence over self-denial. He won't say, oh man, what, what a shame. I mean, that was that big city mansion right next to the river of life. I guess we're going to have to do that refurbished farmhouse out there in the country. No. He says, We've lost everything. Everything. Including eternity. There's no wheeling and dealing at this point. There's no members of the team okay, to get you in. There's no stri bargain to strike. There's, there's no uh, a deal that can be made. The Son of Man is there at that point. He's come to judge in his glory. That's they made the wrong choices. They saw it. False goals. They erected false gods. Now, they, they reap the due reward. All that the last judgment has for us, looking at it backwards, it's like a mirror. Those mirrors will be shattered. Everyone will see what they should have seen the whole time. And Jesus came to explain that indeed, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, and that to live for self is to die to God, and to live for God is to die to self. That Jesus Christ crucified does mean he will rise again and come in glory, and that with his angels he'll bring thousands and ten thousands of blessings for all of those who love his purity and his kingdom. So what will you choose? What choice will you make? Will you choose now to come in self-denial and claim Christ as your Savior? Will you, Christ follower, come in self-denial and follow him and abide in him and make him Lord over all in your life? Will you take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him? Will we all stand to our feet? I invite you in this moment of reflection to think about what choice you would make. And consider what direction your life and even your eternity may be heading. As this is indeed a matter of life and death, a matter of eternal life and eternal death, I beg you to make a decision to deny yourself, to come to Christ, to live for Christ, and to follow. Can I begin to play? I invite you to the altar or in prayer right there in your view that you may speak with the Lord.
follow his leading by the Holy Spirit and experience his grace and not yourself. Take up your cross. Thank you.